Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CPMC's Town Hall on Pastoral Presence uh, and Restorative Justice uh, Practices. Uh, today, we are uh, thrilled to have uh, Father Harry Dean join us, uh, join us from Central Texas, and uh, we'll be sh sharing a little bit more about his ministry there. Uh, in uh in texas on restorative justice uh but first uh let us begin uh with prayer in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit good and gracious god we give you thanks for the gift of of life the the gift of community and uh, especially the gift of your son we pray father that you would uh, this day that you would open our hearts and minds so that we may respond even more deeply to the call of Christ, uh, following after him, denying ourselves and uh, taking up our crosses as we bear witness to the reality of, of your love for all of our sisters and brothers. We pray that you would uh, bless Father Harry Dean in his presentation, that you would give him also an, an awareness of your presence this day. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Son of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as an introduction uh, to Father Harry Dean, Father Harry was raised in West Texas, uh, the town of Midland. Uh, Father Harry Dean received his degree in broadcast journalism from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he worked as a as a news reporter and photographer at two stations in Texas and Oklahoma before entering St. Minard Seminary, uh, followed by uh, St. Mary's Seminary in Houston. Uh, Father Harry was ordained uh, priest in 1996 and was parochial vicar and administrator at various parishes. He has also served in specialized roles, such as working in the Office of Communications as uh, vicar for priest under two bishops uh, in restorative justice ministry uh, and as chaplain at Cedar Break Retreat Center. He is the current dean of the Killeen uh, Temple Deanery and serves as a representative on the Presbyteral Council for Priests and Specialized Ministry. So uh, let us welcome Father Harry. Father Harry, uh, the microphone uh, is all yours. Thanks well, for thank joining you, Father. us. Thank you. Thank you, Father Dustin. And thanks, everybody, for being here today and for all of those who may be seeing this later on uh, post-recording really grateful and humbled to get to present to you today and um, just um, wanted to share something that we uh, had as a presentation originally with our local restorative justice community at a annual day of reflection, um, the reflection on pastoral presence to the incarcerated and to the, the staff who are in the prisons with the incarcerated. This uh, came about um, after I had concluded my time of service in our restorative justice ministry portion uh, in the prison specifically, it was a, almost a six year footprint uh, that I was there, had a lot of beautiful experiences, a lot of really amazing spiritual and, and personal growth throughout that time. And when I concluded, I took a, a, a good bit of time off to process it all. And as I did that, some of the material that we'll, we'll uh, present today came about and seemed like um, uh, it would be good to present to our local community. Karen Clifton was there for Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition. She heard it and asked me to present it to you. And so that's what I'm providing for you today. Look forward to taking questions and giving any answers. I know that my environment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice may mirror a lot of your environments and your respective places, but it may not. And so uh, while there may be some overlap, there may be some things that, that don't apply, um, but we'll just kind of have to see as we go. I did, Father Dustin, want to take a moment and thank you for the work that you're doing in restorative justice, especially St. Joseph House, uh, because in our diocese, we don't have anything like that. It's one of those things that's still hanging out there for us to get accomplished. And you're one of the ones we're looking at to 
not reinvent the wheel. So thank you very much for blazing that trail and for sustaining it. Because that's one thing I see is a lot of places get started, but they don't hang on very long. And uh, it's a it's a tough environment to keep going. So thank you very much for that. So to start with, um, pastoral presence. Um, the way I kind of formatted it is with the three P's. Uh, P is in Paul. And it starts of obviously with presence itself. Um, your pastoral presence, just as who you are as a Catholic Christian. But then that's followed by the second P, which is patience. Presence and patience married together. And the third one, which is pardon, P-A-R-D-O-N, pardon and presence. So when you go as just who you are, the life that you've led, the things that have happened in your life, uh, your circumstances of family, of ministry, whatever, please consider that as something palpable that you bring into the unit just by showing up. Uh, without saying a word, uh, without speaking a sound, there's a presence there that flows from you that's perceptible to the officer corps, to the staff, and to the inmates that they're going to pick up on. And as the longer you're with them, the more they get a sense of what that is, your own personal and unique gifts and your own personal frailties. Because as we know, inmates are keen observers and they are able to discern the, the minutest little things, facial expressions, body language, repetitive phrases that you use. They pick up on these things and they store them away. And they've got a really pretty super collective memory, memory for that, which can be really good, but it can also be a little disarming at times as well when they reflect that back to you and you think, wow, they really are paying attention to what I do. And, and yet that that you bring to them is, can be such a tremendous gift as well. So all of that above. But then beyond that, the presence that you bring as a Catholic Christian, as a person who's been formed by liturgy, by Catholic discipleship specifically, uh, by liturgy, just in the way that we conduct ourselves in the liturgical way, the way that we're formed in our Christian life, um, that just comes forth from you as you go in there and you walk among these souls that live their lives in these institutional settings. Lastly, you are a sacramental presence. You are the Eucharist itself. The Lord is within you as you have communicated with him through that sacrament. You are a Eucharistic offering to them. Please never forget that. Um, just by your showing up, Jesus Christ, truly present, uh, soul, body, and divinity shows up in you. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a life-giving thing. And I heard the inmate say to me as I was preparing to leave over and over again, uh, words to that effect, even if they didn't really know that's what they were reflecting on. We must, I'm reading now, we must therefore consider the Eucharist as thanksgiving and praise to the Father, the sacrificial memorial of Christ and his body, the presence of Christ by the power of his word and of his spirit. That's right from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And that I would submit is you as you walk into these places to offer yourselves in ministry. Patience and presence. Quote St. Monica here. Nothing is far from God. And that includes you. And that includes the people with whom you are ministering, whether it's staff or whether it's the incarcerated, they are not far from God. It may not always feel like that, but to remember those words helps us to be patient with a lot of the things that we encounter within the environment we're ministering in these institutional settings that really doesn't feel like it's very close to God. But with St. Monica, we can say nothing is far from God. So nothing's far from God with yourself, with fellow ministry team members, with ministry members of other Christian communions or other religions. Nothing is far from God with staff, with officers, with chaplains, with wardens, with the incarcerated themselves, with rules and regulations. 
And with our famous word that echoes throughout every unit that we're in, whenever we're there to provide ministry catechetically or liturgically, count. I don't know what everybody else's word is when it's time for the heads to be counted, but ours is count. And I can literally be holding up the Lord, behold the Lamb of God. And the officer appears in the doorway of the place where Eucharist is being celebrated and says, count. And Jesus has to go down. And so does Father Harry. And, and be seated until the officer goes through and gets that head count. It is more important to them than anything, even the decorum of a worship service in progress. That's tough to be patient with sometimes, but it's worth it. When you can work with them, when you can show them that even though in your gut you're saying, doggone it, I wish you wouldn't interrupt me in the middle of that particular feature, but you let them. And you show that empathy that I know you've got a job to do. I know this is important. And if I push back against it, I'm likely to kind of spoil the environment within which I can foster a working relationship by my presence with these souls. Patience does require a quality, what I'm suggesting, of dying to self, serving along the road to eternal life, that kind of dying. And that leads us to pardon, the pardon that we all seek uh, to die to self, to be taken up in the life in Christ, and, and the same for, for our, our flock as well. Reading again, the Christian who unites his own death to that of Jesus views it as a step towards Jesus and an entrance into everlasting life. When the church for the last time speaks Christ's words of pardon and absolution over the dying Christian, seals him for the last time with a strengthening anointing, and gives him Christ in viaticum as nourishment for the journey, she speaks with gentle assurance. Go forth, Christian soul, from this world, in the name of God, the Almighty Father, who created you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who suffered for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, oops, I already said that one, who suffered for you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon you, go forth, faithful Christian. May you live in peace this day. May your home be with God in Zion with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Joseph and all the angels and saints. May you return to your Creator, who formed you from the dust of the earth. May Holy Mary, the angels, and all the saints come to meet you as you go forth from this life. May you see your Redeemer face to face. Such a beautiful prayer that we get to pray when that moment of passing from this life to the next but what I would suggest is that's a very similar dynamic that your presence is entering into when we visit those who are incarcerated. It's a passing of life. They're dying to a lot of things. They're hoping to have restored life by literal pardon. But at the same time, as we know, and certainly in the state of Texas, the conditions which these souls live in, especially if it's for lengthy uh, sentence periods, takes their life from them inordinately, rapidly. It hurries along the process of human uh, dying. And in many cases, they die there by violence, by lack of care, uh, by self-infliction, whatever it might be. Your presence then has a kind of hospice quality to it, where you're there, like we get there, be there as priests when people call us forward in a moment of active dying, they too are actively dying in many ways, some of them beneficial and some of them actually towards that moment in everlasting life. And I take that last line, may you see your Redeemer face to face. To face. So see the Redeemer in the presence that you bring. When you take your training from whatever institution you're preparing for, see your Redeemer. Each time you enter a unit parking lot and encounter anyone coming or going, see your Redeemer. Each time you enter into the gate area to be inspected and escorted, every step you take from the gate area to the place of the scheduled encounter, see your Redeemer. 
in the work of the corrections officers, whether you like that or not, in the maneuvers of the inmates and the way that they conduct themselves, in your companion volunteers, and most importantly, yourself. See your Redeemer. Seeing your Redeemer in this ministry, sharing the presence of those who are actively dying as they spend their appointed time of incarceration, not unlike us, and yet quite unlike us, their potential for this being their last day on this earth. Where I came up with the majority of what I just gave you was from a time of about three weeks of reflection at Holy Cross Retreat Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, Father Tom Smith there, the Franciscan director of that retreat center, uh, assisted me in walking through a period of kind of coming out of the prison ministry and processing. What was that? The kind of, did you get the number of the license plate of that truck? Um, that was the six years of, of working inside Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And what was there for me to reflect on and where these remarks come from were three different places. One was from the homilies that I preached over those six years. Um, I liked to use outlines because there were so many distractions in there that if I didn't stay on point, uh, I knew I could kind of be all over the map or maybe let my emotions take over in a way that would derail the homiletic message that I wanted to stay focused on. Um, and so uh, it gave me an opportunity to look back and see, well, what did you preach on over all those six years? And so I had them, and what I found was about 150 of these outlines for my homilies. And there were some themes in there. Um, I titled them a lot of times just to keep in my mind, this is, Father Harry, this is what you're trying to get across on this particular day. Um, one was called Have a Heart um, on Truth, on Life and Suffering, on the Eucharistic Revival, did several on that one, Restoration of Trust, Suffering Service, Being Children of God, on the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, the Determination to Care, to be determined to be a caring person, Equality in Our Generosity, one was called Let Us Cross to the Other Side, which was essentially from the old ways to the new, that freedom is love of God, and that power is made perfect in love, et cetera, et cetera. That give you a little bit of context of where these remarks are coming from. Another area that I took in the reflective time of trying to shift the gears from being in the, the trenches of, of corrections or restorative justice ministry into to polite parish life was from the cards and letters that I got from inmates and staff over the six years. Uh, I counted them. There was 107 of them. And they contained themes like gratitude, thanksgiving, request for prayers, sharing of good news and sharing of tragic news. Uh, they came from individuals and from group signed cards. Uh, they were most often handwritten, sometimes with really elaborate artistic expressions attached. Some humorous ones from store-bought cards. Um, some were from uh, one of our units in particular were ladies that had committed serious crimes, usually taking somebody's life, but either by injury or by birth, mental deficiencies that were severe. So they couldn't be in the ordinary population. They had to be in this particular unit where the officers were specially trained and we were given special training to be with them as well. Um, a lot of coloring book pages uh, from that one. In, in very creative ways. Um, some of them were apologies um, where they said, you know, uh, you were there, this and that happened. I'm sorry that that happened. Uh, and of course I had my share of needing to respond in kind for my own behaviors as well. And then the last area where I, I took the data to kind of process all this were what I call my field notebooks. There were little pocket sized notebooks. There was a total of 10 of them in which I would write entries as I'd walk from point to point, there was inevitably any number of people that would come up and say, hey, father, dot, dot, dot. Uh, I'm looking for this, I need that. It was a resource question. It was a Catholicism question. It was a just, I need to be heard question. And I wanted to write that down so I could remember to pray for them in my Liturgy of the Hours or at other times of intercessory prayer. So there were 10 of these that got filled up over the course of the uh, six years. And I counted the, the individual entries in them. Each of the notebooks had 
at minimum 170, 170 entries, and at maximum 185 of different individual encounters times 10. And there were some themes in there as well. That included family restoration, general matters of faith, situational needs, dying to self, desperation, departures and arrivals. And after a while, they really kind of helped me to understand this is the kind of turbulence and flow of humanity that came to you as a priest of Jesus Christ um, in a very specific way that's good to take in, good to pray on, good to see how it washed over me as an individual minister, and then to take the, the benefits and beauty of that from there. And from that, and concluding my remarks, just a, a little brief, things to avoid, things to embrace. And as always, feel free to agree or disagree with these. This is just my own experience and what I would offer. Avoid preconceived notions about who the incarcerated are and about who the officers are, what their lives have been, what their lives should be. I think we can get influenced by other uh, resources like books and movies and uh, tele television things. Uh, try to avoid that. Um, embrace instead that each prison community you visit has a story unique to itself, uh, of that unit itself, but of the souls that are living and working there. Avoid filling the room with my voice, like I'm doing right now, I'm not giving a good example here. Uh, filling the room with my voice. Embrace being quiet to listen to the voice of the prison community. And that includes the noise, the background noise. Background noise in a prison community can be very telling about what the souls who come to your worship service or to your catechesis or whatever program you've got, what, what they're coming out of and, and what's happening to them in their lives. Um, being quiet to listen to the voice of the prison community uh, upon entrance, when you're getting patted down and your stuff is, is being uh, being searched through, listen to what the officers are talking about in the background. Kind of like when you're checking out at the grocery store and sometimes, you know, you kind of expect the checker to pay attention to you, but they're having a conversation with the person that's sacking the groceries instead because that, that's who they know. The officers do that as they take care of us. There's things to learn from that. There's things that are going on in their lives, uh, individually or as officers there, that we can take in and, and be present to. Let's see here. I'm getting uh, lost in my notes. Um, oh, yes. Um, in the group gathering itself, in the group liturgy, in the group catechesis, if they're asking certain questions um, and they're frustrating questions, uh, and some, some of the times you feel like people are on purpose trying to derail the direction that you're going, that's saying something. And to be present to that, realizing that you've got a discord going on inside, even an irritation maybe even an anger. Um, okay, that's that's my stuff. But why are they presenting that as their stuff? And, and how can I bring my presence uh, to that to meet a need that necessary, isn't necessarily my need to present to them, but it's their need uh, to, to present to me? Um, try the best that you can to be able, not necessarily to accept what you consider to be unjust rules and regulations, but to, to understand where they're coming from and then in your own way, circumvent them without breaking them, uh, where you can actually kind of uh, massage them in a way that reduces their harshness uh, that may be there. Um, avoid seeing things as all or nothing. There's a lot of gray in there and it's, it's hard to discern sometimes. I think time is a really beautiful assistant there um, measure what's happening one visit to the next, maybe do some, some writing down of your experiences as you go along so that you can see what your presence is offering and how it's being responded to time to time. First impressions, as always, aren't always the best, and they're not always the best indicators of how things are going to unfold. Um, these folks, uh, as you may know already, oftentimes take a great deal of time to develop trust both the incarcerated and the staff. And even after you start to sense that you're being lent trust, it can be pulled back or it can be dramatically increased to where it's too much information, but too late, you've already got it. 
And so now your presence is involved with that. I think the final thing that the best lesson I learned for myself and, and certainly would want to share with you is uh, they are sinful and they are graceful, just like I am sinful and I am graceful. And so we want to embrace those things and try and avoid saying they're not like me when really in many ways they are at the same time they're not. But we are walking that journey together and you're providing your presence. So that's what I have, Father Dustin. Thank you, uh, Father Harry. Well, wow, there's a lot there that um, I've already got a few questions formulated in my mind. But be before I jump in, uh, uh, I'd like to, I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the town hall. Please, for those that are joining us, all uh, of you, uh, I see more or less kind of right over 50 or so that are live with us. Uh, if you would like to add, ask a question, uh, for Father Harry, questions or comments, please uh, place them in the chat box. We're not doing our normal kind of town hall style, which is to open the screen and, and kind of do uh, direct Q&A that way. But rather, if you'll just submit your questions, comments in the chat box for Father Harry, uh, that would be fantastic. So you may do that between now and, and the end of the town hall. Uh, but I'll go ahead and get things started. Uh, I'll take that opportunity. I, as you were, again, there's a lot there that I was thinking about, but I was wondering if you might have a story or two. And I've got I've, I've got two kind of situations that I, I would be interested in hearing, given the your in-depth experience among the incarcerated. And, and one, we know one of the nation's most, you know, largest carceral states in the state of Texas. Uh, if you could share with us maybe one one pastoral encounter um, that uh, that we're that for you kind of really encapsulates that the art of listening or it's something that you heard that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have heard um, an encounter that you had that maybe you go back to that you maybe you've already written down a vignette or you know of that encounter. Uh, that for you really kind of crystallizes the how essential pastoral presence is in this context in, in in the prisons. And then the second question that I would ask is one of the maybe pastoral encounters, a pastoral presence where it was incredibly difficult maybe to be present, uh, whether it was because of the conditions of the prison or because of the person that you were ministering to. Um, but but first, I, I'd be curious to hear if if you do. I mean, if you have a if there's a vignette or a, an encounter that maybe you go back to, you draw from uh, as an example, or a, I, I hate to use the term model, but as a as an occasion that you saw and witnessed, kind of the power of pastoral presence. Well, the, the one unit that I described with the ladies that had the significant mental disabilities. Um, the degree to which they manifest those symptoms is always pretty eye-catching, ear-catching, heart-rendering. And um, there was a one lady that, um, two features there. So in that mass, you had to be prepared for any number of things to happen that don't normally happen in mass. Um, these are people that don't have the same sense of decorum of when to, let alone stand, sit, and kneel. It's when to be quiet and when to chime in. As you're preaching in that particular unit, a lot of times they think it's question and answer time. And so they start keying off of your remarks. But there was a lady in there that part of her feature was um, Eucharist was a birthday celebration for her. I don't know where this came from. It might've come from a preaching moment, from conversation with her, her peers. So when we were there, she would oftentimes break open into a full-throated happy birthday to you song. And the first time it happened, I wasn't really sure what the heck to do with that. Um, but your presence is, is the reason that it's going on. And now you've got a decision to make, middle of the liturgy, do I become grumpy Father Harry, who's trying to wrangle this thing into some 
sensibility of, of, of a normal liturgy experience or do I just go with the flow? And I went with the flow. I just, with all the things that go on in any one of our, our celebrations of the Eucharist, you just have to be able to, not really knowing what to do with that. I didn't know that about her at the time. The first time it happened, we had a follow-up conversation after Mass about it, and that was her reason. But it's because it's like Jesus's birthday party. Um, he's You keep telling me that he, he rises from the dead, that he's born again, that it's from his passion. And so I just feel like it's time to sing happy birthday. And so she sang it um, the first time everybody else joined in. And then after that, the peers were kind of on top of her to, to tamp that down. I tried never to, to dissuade her from doing it. So I think that was one. Um, and then how did you, what was the second question on that one? Well, and, and, you know, we, and we can also come back to it later too, but I was just curious if there was, you mentioned the noise, which I oh, thought okay. was very, very telling. I mean, and... I don't know if there's if there was a, an experience or an encounter that that um, that highlights the importance of, of being aware of not only the the voice of the person in front of you but the ambiance the the kind of the soundful environment. So we had two distinct areas of ministry endeavor. Deacon Ronnie Lastavica, who was my mentor and also the the lead. Uh, person in our corrections uh, uh, efforts there in the, the city of Gatesville area. And he and I would partner uh, both for liturgy and the uh, population services, as we call them, but then the restricted housing. Uh, we spent a great deal of time in restricted housing at the men's unit in particular because it was gigantic. Uh, they had a lot of single cell fellas and they had a lot of two men to one cell guys, um, two different categories actually three. One was um, folks that were identified as being in gangs that they didn't want in the general population to organize. Uh, second was uh, ones who were violent uh, to themselves, to others on a consistent basis or were escape risks. Usually they, they went hand in hand. And then the third one was pretty significantly mentally ill people. And uh, so um, we wanted to be present to them. In the, I'm, I'm thinking as I give you all this example, it was our men's unit, again, a 3,000 maximum uh, number of, of souls. It was always full with the attendant number of officers to take care of what essentially was a small city of incarcerated. It had an A side and a B side. One side was for people who had movement privileges. It had its own noise ambiance. Mm -hmm. And one side was for the restricted housing people. When you go in there, it's all enclosed. It's all concrete. It's all bars. It's all metal doors that have uh, give to them a little bit when they open and close side to side or going back and forth. So you go to the individual cell. You keep a couple of feet back until you can assess the situation of the person in the cell there. Uh, if they didn't have their light on and they wanted to talk to you, we would say, I can't talk to you until you turn the light on. Uh, we wore a thrust vest uh, for those because there was a lot of sharp edged instruments and spearing instruments that were fashioned in there that they were very creative about being able to launch at you. We wore goggles. Um, we never got any of the nasty stuff thrown on us like the officers did, but it was around. If you were standing next to an officer that was about to get, uh, they called it dashing, dashed, then you kind of needed to step away or you were going to get some of that on you. But um the whole time you're talking to this human being just inches away because you, you had to get close to be able to hear. And yet that was a danger in and of itself. Um, you uh, had all of this just raucous noise going on, echoing by the hard surfaces. Uh, the guys like to do this thing called mule kicking, where they would position their bodies and kick backwards into the door to get a maximum sound. If more than I learned this over time, if more than one guy was doing that, it was meant to to be a diversion for something else that was being planned in another part of that pod. So they worked with each other to get the officers distracted in order to do different things. Sometimes not that nefarious, but it was just kind of the way they did their business. And so you had that going on. You had men who uh, I don't know if you come from a loud family. But people, those of us who come from loud families where everybody yells all the time from room to room in the house, oh, and then they answer, oh, well, the, those places were like that too, but on steroids. 
And you walk in there waiting for your escort and you sit there for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes taking this in. And it's kind of jarring. It'd be like standing next to the to the outside of a, of a jet engine on an airplane until you got used to it. So that would be one example. And then you just try and focus in. I'm here for the Lord. I'm here to, to try and let this person know somebody wants to listen to them and, and then be able to reflect that in conversation. That's so well well put, Father Harry. As someone who goes into these confinement dorms and the, the noise, and I already have some uh, hearing issues already to go into these dorms, and you're, you're in conversation with people that are in desperate need of, of interpersonal relationship and to be heard and yet you're dealing with the excruciating bangings and yellings and the doors slamming uh the echoing uh throughout these concrete warehouses essentially uh is 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 has i mean it, it almost hurts because you're trying to tune in to that one voice through plexiglass for me it's a plexiglass window uh with holes in it um but it's it's um it's difficult to do and you know i oftentimes almost kind of you know fantasize i wish we had like a a therapist room you know where we could just go quiet a, a respectful environment to listen and to hear the hopes and anxieties you know the wishes of of and the concerns of of those that you're visiting um you you painted a, a very um uh i think well for me very accurate and familiar kind of environment of what it means to 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 try to be present in the midst of that we have had some questions that have uh kind of popped up here and just again uh a reminder for folks to you can submit questions either in the q a box or also in our uh web chat here um the first question uh, Kathleen asked, uh, how can we acquire that your the prayer was beautiful, Father Harry? How can we acquire a copy or where can we find it online? The uh, Go Forth Christian Soul Prayer is uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church 1020, 1020. That's where I pulled that from. Okay. And so maybe um, Kara or someone would be able to submit that uh, into the box uh, there again. I'm sorry, if you could read it again, Father Harry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1020, 1020. 1020. Okay. Hope that helps, uh, Kathleen. Uh, and David uh, has asked, how do you prepare an inmate who is expecting to be released back into the community? That's a really great question. And we had a lot of experience with that over time and developed some things. Um, one thing I would say is when somebody gets parole, be really super attentive to any emotional changes. We had a number of them that committed suicide after they got parole because they weren't prepared to go back or because when that finally happened, somebody in their family, knowing that they're about to get out, that they're no longer going to be away from them any longer, dumps the news on them that they don't want them, that they're not welcome. And uh, that can be wives or husbands that do that to their spouses. And there can be some pretty strong repercussions there. So we lost a number of people to suicide on the occasion of, of being let go. On the happier side, one of the things I always like to do is ask them, where are you paroling to? Family home, halfway house, whatever it might be get an address, find the zip code, look up uh, on the, uh, on I use Google, whatever your search engine is, the zip code for the closest Catholic church. And then download the bulletin for that church and bring it to them so that they can read it and start to get a, a, a sense of this is the place I'm encouraging you to go when you get out. And then I would call them and tell them who I was. I, I try and talk to the pastor if they had an actual person for social justice ministry and say, I've got this individual. They're likely to be coming out. No idea if they're actually going to come to your parish, but if they did, is there anything there? Or what would you recommend I tell them to plug into your parish? So I would do that. 
The other thing was some advice our Bishop Joe Vasquez gave me uh, because he was auxiliary of Galvest Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston for a while. And they have a, a much more robust restorative justice uh, 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 kind of umbrella of activities than we do, just things that we even we dream about. But one of the pieces of advice he gave me was to uh, for those especially who have really found their faith, I'm jacked up and I want to get out there and be everything that a parish will let me be. He asked us to tell them, don't do that. Go in and for an entire year, just attend. Let people get to know you as you are, not mm -hmm. as this person mm -hmm. who's burning to give their, their testimony about how they changed in prison. Because not everybody knows how to deal with that. And you can get started on a bad foot right away by putting that on people who aren't ready to receive it. So let them get to know you just as a person who's coming and going to mass, to coffee and donuts, to certain uh, kind of parish things. And then at some point, a year later, drop the dime. I'm also a person that's on parole or, uh, as we say, off paper. I did my full my full sentence. And um, this is a feature of my life as well. So those would be a couple of things I would throw out there. Those are great points. Uh, so... One thing that um, that I was wondering as you were talking, and, and especially as you were talking about going into the restricted uh, housing units, um, I've, I've got my own thoughts about it. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious how kind of what is your practice, or what you know, what was your practice then, a kind of spiritual practice, or what did you find to be spiritually edifying and kind of preparing you? both in being present uh, to those that you were ministering to, and then maybe when you leave those facilities and those experiences, you know, how you kind of process, you know, those experiences. So in other words, kind of the spiritual practice of, of preparing to be present in these, in those conditions. So for me personally, Father, it was important for me to be faithful to the liturgy of the hours because that ministry would so unscramble me sometimes, just the simple structure of the liturgy of the hours where I didn't have to think and I could just enter into prayer and it carried me. That was really, really helpful. And then over time, I started to get interested in what the the incarcerated folks were interested in. I had a guy in a single cell that uh, I used to do a lot of carrying materials in. I, I Until I got hooked up with a free uh, resource place, I was buying a lot of material on my own from a local Catholic, a pretty, pretty good Catholic bookstore in Austin. And uh, and so I'd bring stuff in and, and I happened to give a, a pamphlet uh, something from St. Augustine to this guy. And he was just lit on fire by St. Augustine. So over time, I ended up getting him whole volumes of, of the works of St. Augustine. And one day, his cell, the guy in the cell next to him, after I left him, he, he was laughing at me. I, I said, "What? what's so funny? He goes, you know, he can't read. <laughs> and I go, I don't think so, because the guy was telling me the, the things that were that were in there. So I don't know if he was getting that guy to read it or what it was. So that said something to me. So I would pick up some Augustine and, mm -hmm. and start reading that. I would kind of try and track with what was, was mm -hmm. connected with that. that. That was another one. A lot of intercessory prayer, um, just going and sitting and, and just saying, Lord, help me. Um, I'm really troubled today. I'm really rattled today. Um, I'm really ticked off today. That person, that, that system practice got under my skin. Uh, this ministry partner, uh, you know, somebody on the team got under my skin, helped me not to be that way tomorrow, uh, those kinds of things. E Eucharist was huge, is huge. Um, re the real reconciliatory moment for personal identity, but also for communing with the Lord. Uh, that was really big. But one feature that Deacon Ronnie and I had that not everybody's going to have, we had a 45 minute drive each way. And so we did processing time to and from just because there was two guys sitting in a pickup truck and we use that time to, to talk things through. I, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, that, that's, um, if you do have a, a ministry partner, 
Uh, and I'm sure many here can attest to that, how invaluable it is to be able to have someone else to kind of talk things through some of the conversations that you had, um, prayer even. Um, and, you know, as you're, as you were talking for me, it's the same thing with liturgy of the hours. I think it would be, might be something in our future, uh, Karen or whoever, uh, Courtney to think about liturgy of the hours, you know, for those that are engaged in prison ministry, I think, because, you know, I, for me, that was, that saved me from, um, I think just crumbling under the weight of oppression that you, the waves of oppression and misery that you encounter when you're engaging in, in, in pastoral, you know, being pastorally present, right? You're, you're creating the conditions to hear some of the worst things, some of the, the real heart, the things that are really going on in the heart of, of those that are, you know, uh, in these prisons and these facilities and to be able to engage in liturgy of the hours for me is one, it's kind of cathartic itself. I mean, it, it, there's a realism in those Psalms. Uh, there's a calling out for God to be present for God's justice. Um, that there's something about entering into that, that prayer, that cry, uh, with the psalmist. Uh, there's also, I, I found over time that I discovered and have developed this kind of a deeper appreciation of how Israel was a people of in exile, a people that were in prison in, in many ways and, and were made strangers in a strange land and under the tyranny of, of oppression and, um, and harshness and judgment uh, came to encounter a loving, you know, faithful God, and and so liturgy of the hours. I think for for those of us that are engaged weekly, even biweekly, monthly, in this kind of ministry of 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 being pastorally present to those that are incarcerated. To me, I, I think is um, it's obviously not mandatory for those that are not um, under uh, promises of holy orders, but I think it would be in, I would encourage it um, to find there's different ways of doing it. You know that doesn't have to be as cumbersome and you know maybe complicated at times as what we <clears throat> pray, but having those prayers um, and and as you said, I love the way you put it, Father Harry, that it's there's something that you're once it's a habit it's you don't have to be as attentive to the mechanics you can I, I, no other way for me to think of it than just kind of tapping in and entering into these ancient prayers that ground us in a larger community very, very similar to praying the rosary i would suggest mm -hmm. in that regard and one thing that I, I've never forgot since my first chunk of seminary was at St. Meinrad, a very uh, beautiful and, and robust Benedictine community, you know, everything was sung. And um, and so we learned as diocesan seminarians to sing the liturgy of the chant, the liturgy of the hours. And one novice who's now been a priest for many years said to me back when he was a novice and I was a seminarian, I sing those psalms because it just helps to bring happiness into my heart and carry away the burdens. And I've never forgotten that. So there were days where I would come home after uh, Deacon Ronnie dropped me off. And instead of just rote praying liturgy of the hours for evening prayer or night prayer, whatever it might be, I would just sing. And depending on the intensity of emotion I was a feeling or crushing despair, as you mentioned, I feel, felt that too. I would just sing and I would sing loud and I, and I would sing with, with a lot of heart. Sometimes I would cry and, and, and just kind of try and get it all off my chest. It was like another form of being able to, uh, to present to the Lord, the, the, the heartfelt passion of, of the moment. So I, I would highly, highly recommend that for sure. Thank you for that, Father Harry. And, and the, uh, I think it just, it, 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 we bring this up a lot, I know, at CPMC, but really emphasizing prayer in this ministry, um, active prayer, 
uh, communal prayer uh, because otherwise it can become, um, we internalize it naturally. Anyone that's empathetic is going to internalize the sorrow, the sadness. Um, so uh, let's see. So I am, um, okay, see a, a note here from David. He, that I have found that the prisoners welcome the structured liturgy of the hours um, and without the hymns even. Um, and uh, so thank you for that, David. It's good to know that we're being reminded of the, the, the value of the liturgy of the hours for those that are incarcerated. And then we have a, a comment here from uh, Richard. Uh, I was in prison for 10 years up until COVID March of 2020. I was allowed back. I was allowed back. October of 2022, the only person back in prison after many difficult times, I left early in December 2022. So you're, <clears throat> I'm guessing, Richard, you're saying that you were in prison ministry uh, for those 10 years. Um, uh, and after many difficult times, uh, I left early in December 2022. I, I'm, I'm reading between the lines there after many difficult times. Um you know that there's stories there of of the challenges of of pastoral ministry in 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 these facilities. Um, got it right. Okay, thank uh, you. Any 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 maybe anything uh, as we kind of kind of near the end of 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 this town hall, uh, Father Harry, that you would like to um, to share or any any maybe concluding thoughts, remarks uh, for those that are joining. I I would say that for all of the kind of um, struggles that any of you go through, they're absolutely normal because it really is one way I try to describe not just the ministry, but the environment of the ministry is that this is another world. People think they know what goes on in prisons by what they see on television. And a lot of those do give good slices of life imagery. But if you're not in there to smell it, uh, to hear it, to, um, and in Father's case and mine, to have celebrated the sacrament of uh, penance and reconciliation uh, with, with souls such as that, you really don't, people on the outside that have never dipped their toe in this and spent personal time inside really can't fathom, A, the environment, but B, the human beings occupying the environment. For, for, for a lot of us, the lives that they lived up until their crime committal or, or what have you really are really different. Uh, it may have some features that are the same in terms of parent behaviors and family behaviors or hard times versus flush times, but even then they're different. And so I always tried to, to describe it as if I had been told, okay, Father Harry, I need you to go and um, be in the middle of Ethiopia at a parish in this rural area without any training whatsoever and go and be fruitful. Well, as you all know, Catholicism's done a little bit differently everywhere you go, even within the same diocese, let alone country to country. And you have to, you have to know that, that now I've got a whole big learning curve just to understand how to read people, how to understand people, how to validate or, or to invalidate what they're presenting. And it just takes some time to, to do it. I left at the end of six years um, because I have some, some mental emotional things that were already there that were really great to draw on, to share empathetically with, but they also became things that left me vulnerable to not having enough kind of strength to be able to power through. Did pretty good for the six years, but they started to pile up at the end. But the defining thing that discerned me to say it's time to, to continue to help with this on the outside was when I caught myself in the, the, the what I call the decision tree mode, my discernment and, and uh, uh, this is how I'm going to make a decision about this or that, doing it like people that I knew who were incarcerated with the dysfunctional aspects to it, as opposed to with the virtues, with, with our, our Catholic formation. I, I, was, I was beginning to think like an inmate mm -hmm. and, and it troubled me because I didn't want to go that direction. And uh, was influencing my behaviors and attitudes and responses, et cetera. And um, so, and it took me a little while to be able to be in a parish again. I felt very uncomfortable uh, at the altar in a parish with all the neat and tidiness to it, 
with with some of the things that I saw with the way people conduct themselves in, in, in the pews these days. I'd been out for six years, had hardly stepped a toe in there, and it was just very disorienting. So in some ways, that's a blessing because now I think I have a little bit of a taste of reentry uh, issues for the for the folks as well, but certainly nothing is uh, like they have. But um, those, are, those are some of the kind of final thoughts, I would say. Just take care of yourself, take care of each other, um, note things when they come up, talk about them, don't hide them, don't be embarrassed to be weak, uh, and don't be embarrassed to be strong. Uh, and just let the Lord work through you the best best way that you can present. We appreciate that, Father Harry. And we, we appreciate your ministry, your insights, uh, your, frankly, just even, you know, an hour, the, your authenticity in this ministry, the, um, the witness uh, that you've shared. Well, so Father uh, Harry, would you mind giving us a blessing as we conclude? name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We ask the Lord and the power of his Spirit to descend upon each and every soul who has been with us today and who will hear this in recording in the future. The blessing of love, the blessing of peace, the blessing of mercy, and the blessing of humility. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Father Harry. Uh, so very much. I, I'm sure this will be um, of great value and resources for so many of our ministers. All right. Peace. Peace.